Well, we, we have a series going on this year uh, from time to time. It's called A Cloud of Witnesses, and you've got cards. Uh, I hope you've been collecting them. Uh, I think you get ice cream if you get them all, I don't know, but whatever. They're great cards, and this one in particular is uh, one that I'm excited about for a lot of reasons. I'll get to it in a moment. But when we thought of the series, we said, well, let's pick the top 12 Christian voices, influential, the most influential in Christian history. And we... <laughs> It, there's just too much to argue about. So we just said, let's pick the 12 we really like. So some of them are unmistakable uh, in their impact. Others are people you don't know about. And this one in particular uh, is one who has affected you. I guarantee it. It's because you're at Westmont College. And uh, probably because of some of your parents. Uh, but you need to know about. And uh, Dr. Alistair Chapman will be uh, talking about John R.W. Stott. And uh, let me just... I, I got a Vita here from Alistair. It is so like him. It's like th three sentences, you know. Uh, maybe the most important things, he's married to Margaret. He has four children. Uh, his PhD is from Cambridge. Uh, he came to Westmont in 2004. He teaches courses in modern European history and world history survey. He's currently researching the impact of immigration and imperial decline on English society after 1945. All true. Uh, but I want you to know, uh, Alistair Chapman is a treasure uh, for this college. And uh, I can't begin to tell you how much he means to me and to uh, all of us who, who pray and work hard for the uh, quality of education you're getting here. So Alistair, uh, welcome to this platform. We're eager to hear what you have to say. And come on up, and let me say a prayer for you when you get here. Yeah. And Father, I pray that Alistair would run down the path you set for him this morning, because you have set his heart free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Can you remember anything that the speaker said at your high school graduation? Probably not. There's so much going through everyone's minds on such occasions that sometimes the speeches seem a waste. But at Westmont's commencement a few years ago, the speaker, David Brooks, said something I have never forgotten. Brooks is a columnist for the New York Times, and he's written extensively about the importance of character which made it all the more surprising when he said this. Commencement addresses have a certain formula. The school asks someone who has achieved a certain level of career success to give a speech telling you that career success is not important. Then we're supposed to give you a few minutes of completely garbage advice. Listen to your inner voice, be true to yourself, follow your passion, your future is limitless. First, my generation gives you a mountain of debt, then we give you career derailing advice that will prevent you from ever paying it off. <laughs> it was funny, it was honest, it was, I think, tongue in cheek. But when people laughed at Brooks's remarks, it was nervous laughter. For he seemed to imply that there might be a contradiction between doing what's right and being successful. And none of us want to believe that, do we? We want to believe that we can follow our hearts, do the right thing, and still manage to put food on the table. It used to be that Americans didn't have to worry so much about this. If you lived in the US in the 20th century and had a college degree, your future usually looked bright. Even if you didn't have a degree, you could often get a job that paid well and provided good benefits. In the 21st century, by contrast, increased global competition means that it's harder for Americans to get the sorts of jobs that their parents had. Your generation thus often experiences significant pressure to get ahead, to get a job, to get a degree that will lead to a job. Life is competitive, you're told. Work hard, go to college, get an internship, play the game. But then, if you're a Christian, you pick up your Bible and read that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. 
Deny yourself and become a servant, Jesus says. Doesn't this sound rather like what David Brooks called career derailing advice? So, is it? Can we be virtuous and successful? Can we follow God and survive in an increasingly competitive world? Can we pursue Christ and excellence? To put it another way, can we be godly and ambitious? Paul in Philippians 2 warns us against selfish ambition. But is there such a thing as godly ambition? I want to suggest this morning that there is. And I'm going to do that by talking about John Stott, who is one of the great cloud of witnesses that we're considering in chapel this year. Most of you have never heard of Stott, but he used to be well known. He was a global Christian leader in the second half of the 20th century and extremely good looking. He spoke at Westmont several times. Time magazine included him in their 2005 list of the 100 most influential people in the world because of his preaching and the role he played in the growth of the global church. He was famous for how he explained the Bible with exceptional clarity, both in his sermons and in more than 40 books. Additionally, at a time when many Christians were suspicious of the life of the mind, Stott made a convincing case that God is pleased when we study hard whatever the subject matter. You may not have heard of Stott, but he shaped the thinking of many of your professors and pastors. So how did Stott become so influential? And how did he do it in a way that was godly and not self-serving? Was the key that he became a pastor? No. You can be a pastor with selfish ambition and a chemist whose ambitions are holy. So what was the secret source? Let me start by telling you about his life and career, and then I'll mention three commitments that allowed Stott to excel and still be someone who could read Jesus' words about self-sacrifice with a clear conscience. Stott was born in London in 1921. He went to a boarding school that was very much like Hogwarts, Houses, scarves, formal dinners, sporting competitions, all without the magic. At school, he played rugby and cello and developed an enviable work ethic. This was also the time when he gave his life to Christ. He went to university to study French and German and was set to pursue a career as a diplomat. However, he developed a love for studying God's word and explaining it to others. After his early sermons, people were encouraging him to train to teach the Bible. So he switched from foreign languages to theology to complete his degree. Stott's friends saw his ambition in how hard he worked. He studied at his desk for eight hours every day and would leave social gatherings early so he could get up the following morning. He read the Bible consistently and rigorously. He participated in a variety of ministries. Stott lived out the words of 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. This isn't to say that Stott was all work and no play. He loved nature, especially birds, but he spent almost no time on the 1940s equivalents of Netflix. Stott believed in rest, but he didn't indulge in it or live for it. When he graduated, he took an entry-level job in a church in central London, where he worked like someone with his sights set high. When the church's pastor died four years later, the congregation asked him to take over. Stott began to receive invitations to travel and preach abroad. That provided him with the chance to spot even more species of birds, but more importantly, it allowed him to become one of the first truly global preachers, along with Billy Graham. He honed a series of sermons that he gave to students on every continent, and then published them in a book, Basic Christianity, which was translated into more than 60 languages and sold millions. All his books were deep, but accessible, 
and they became classic examples of clear thinking about the word and the world. I could say much more about Stott's success. You can attribute some of it to natural gifting. He was also the right person in the right place at the right time, a well-educated, upper-class Englishman with good connections, just as traveling by jet meant people could traverse the world more easily than ever before. More important, however, was that Stott was hungry. He was ambitious. He wanted to be an effective preacher, and he worked extremely hard to that end. One sacrifice that he made was the decision not to marry so he could devote himself more completely to his ministry. I imagine that little, if anything, of what I've said so far has surprised you. To succeed, you need to minimize distractions, work hard, make sacrifices, use your gifts, seize opportunities. Isn't that what your parents, your pastors, your professors, and your conductors and coaches have said to you all along? The danger is that it works. By this I mean that if you work hard and aren't addicted to substances or Snapchat, you are likely to do well in the world. The 18th century Methodists are a great example of this. Most started poor, but many of their sober, diligent children became rich. Christian liberal arts colleges have often filled this role in North America, allowing the children of Christians to come and pursue degrees that will lead to remunerative careers. Which raises the question, how can we be sure that our hard work and success is pleasing to Jesus? To put it another way, how can our ambition be godly and not selfish? How can Westmont serve Christ's kingdom and not just our careers? Here's where I think John Stott can be helpful to us. I'd like to suggest three things Stott did that kept his ambition from degenerating into self-serving self-promotion. Three characteristics that we can imitate if we want to be people who are godly as well as ambitious. One, Stott never stopped seeking Jesus. Every morning when he woke up, Stott would swing his legs over the side of the bed and pray the three prayers on the card you received when you arrived this morning. And that was just the beginning of a pattern of spiritual discipline that characterized his days. Stott didn't just encourage others to read the Bible, to pray, and be part of a church community. He did them himself, faithfully, quietly, daily, for decades. We have no chance of overcoming our self-centeredness if we don't expose ourselves regularly to God's truth in the Bible and if we don't ask him to help us regularly. Spending time with God each day will remind us of his greatness and help us desire that his name would be hallowed more than our own. Two, Stott was generous. If you go to the library after chapel and pick up one of Stott's books, you may find a note saying that all the author's earnings were to be given away. Stott could have lived extravagantly, but he lived in a two-room apartment with many books, but few clothes or other possessions. The money he didn't need, he gave away. He lived simply because he wanted to be in solidarity with those who suffered hunger and deprivation in other parts of the world. Generosity is perhaps the best antidote to selfish selfishness, and it is thus a great ally for those who want to be sure that they're pursuing excellence for Jesus' sake and not just their own. Third, Stott was committed to sharing the gospel with others. God gives his people a great variety of work to do in the world. He may ask you to be a farmer, a fundraiser, a carpenter, a parent, a teacher, a chef, a physical therapist, an entrepreneur, a pilot. The list is long. All can contribute to the work of his kingdom. But whatever else you do, God wants you to be a light for him in a world that needs to hear about him. That can be scary 
Why? Because although the gospel is good news, it's also offensive. Even for preachers like Stott, there's a temptation to downplay the gospel. It's much easier to encourage people to be nice and do their best. But there will be plenty of people who won't like you telling them, however politely, that they can't help themselves and need a divine rescuer. What it looks like for us to be witnesses for God will vary. But when Jesus said that if we want to follow him, we would have to pick up a cross, he meant it. We can and should seek to use the gifts he has given us to the fullest. We should be ambitious. But godly ambition involves giving all our plans and desires to him and being prepared to say and do the right thing, even when that is costly. I said that John Stott spoke at Westmont on several occasions. Unlike me, Stott was a world-renowned preacher, so I'm going to step aside at this point and let you listen to part of an address he gave at Westmont in 1987. The sermon was on John 20, 21. The context is that Jesus has just risen from the dead, and he is now sending his disciples into the world to take the good news of his saving death and resurrection to all peoples. Here's a five-minute clip of what Stott had to say to your predecessors 30 years ago. But when Jesus came from heaven to earth, he left heaven behind him. He didn't bring anything with him except himself. He identified completely with our life on earth. He became a human being like us, with all the vulnerability and the pain and the frailty that that involved. He lived our life, and he then died our death. He could not have identified himself more completely than he did by the Incarnation and the Atonement. And that was the cost of incarnational mission to him. And I don't think we realize sufficiently that that is the cost of incarnational mission to us. We are called to enter other people's worlds. He entered our world. He did not stay in the safe immunity of his heaven. He didn't shout the gospel to us from the sky. He actually entered our world. It was total identification, though without any loss of his own identity. He became one of us, but he did not cease to be himself. When becoming man, he remained God. It was identification without loss of identity. And that's what we're called to today. Identification with people, entering into their worlds, into their thought world, into the world of their pain, their suffering, their alienation, their loneliness. As one writer has put it, we can only <clears throat> commend the faith insofar as we go out and put ourselves with loving sympathy inside the doubts of the doubter, the questions of the questioner, and the loneliness of those who have lost the way. That's incarnational mission, entering into their world, though without any loss of our own identity. As we identify with them in their need, we do not surrender our own Christian convictions, our Christian values or standards or lifestyle. We remain ourselves as followers of Jesus, but we identify with them in their need and pain. And it's very costly. We much prefer to keep our distance. I'm afraid, if I may be honest with you this morning, we evangelical Christians are often more like the Pharisees than we are like Jesus. And there is a great deal of evangelical Pharisaism about today. The Pharisees had a false understanding of holiness. They thought that in order to maintain their holiness, they had to keep their distance from the world. 
So if a leprosy sufferer came anywhere near them, they would pick up a stone and throw it at him to make him keep his distance. If a prostitute came near a Pharisee, a Pharisee would gather his skirts round him and shrink in horror from a woman like that. Not Jesus. Jesus touched untouchables. Jesus put out his hand and touched the leprosy sufferer into healing. When a prostitute came behind him when he was reclining at a meal, Jesus didn't shrink from her. She wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. She covered them with kisses. And Jesus received her love. He didn't shrink from her. He didn't shrink from anybody. He was not contaminated by that contact with sinners. He was known as the friend of publicans and sinners. The Pharisees had no publicans and sinners among their friends. Jesus had many. How many have you got? Are all your friends Christians? I think it is a mark of how far we've strayed from the example of Jesus. We need to be friends of publicans and sinners like him, though without losing any of our Christian identity. We need to involve ourselves in their lives, a model of mission. Here's the problem. At Westmont, we're pretty good at making you ambitious. We can load you up with assignments to make you learn more and work hard. We can talk about your gifts and help you land internships. But we can't make you pray, or be generous, or treasure the Christian good news. That is something you must do yourself if you are to be a person of godly ambition. Better yet, that is something you need to commit to pursuing with your sisters and brothers in your church or small group. If you become a person of godly ambition, will everything work out for you? Maybe, but not necessarily. Jesus didn't promise that life would be rosy if we followed him. To go back to David Brooks, there may be times when the gospel is career derailing advice in a world that does not acknowledge Christ's lordship. But it is certainly not garbage advice. In 2004, David Brooks wrote a column in the New York Times with the title, Who is John Stott? Brooks, who is Jewish, complained that the general American public, when they thought of evangelical Christians, thought of the bozos depicted in the media. Instead, he suggested they should think of Stott, who he described as courteous, confident, and optimistic. Yet, Brooks went on, Stott was willing to take unpopular positions. He did not think all faiths were equally valid, and he was committed to sharing the truth of Christ with unbelievers. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, said the author to the book of Hebrews. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Ben Patterson asked me to speak on John Stott because I wrote a book about him. Here's what amazes me. I went into the project expecting to like Stott less once I was finished. But actually, he's someone I respect more now than I did when I began. I do so because of his faithful commitment to pursue Christ and excellence. For him, that meant becoming world famous. It probably won't for you or me. But I believe godly ambition is the way to live to the full the life that God has given us. What about you? Do you need to become more ambitious? To spend more of your time and energy on what matters? Do you need to become more godly? Seeking Jesus every day, giving to others, and making the gospel known. The two work together. A desire for God's glory provides the most powerful 
as well as the most pure motivation that there is. My prayer is that at Westmont, we would be known as those who are not just ambitious or just godly, but both. I'm going to pray the prayer at the bottom of your witness card. Please join me in praying this aloud if this expresses the desire of your heart too. And then when we've said amen, you are dismissed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen.